Okay, welcome to the next episode of the Strong Dad Army podcast. Again, jumping straight in, today's guest, um, he's got a bit of a, a list of things this guy's achieved in his life, but obviously no doubt he'll tell you all about that himself. So just to let you know a bit about him, he's a Royal Marines veteran, he's a professional MMA fighter, he's a gym owner, and I think, if I'm right, he's a restaurant owner as well. Um, but most importantly, like most of you guys listening, is a dad. So today's guest is Martin Stapes Stapleton. Welcome on, pal. Hi, mate. Thanks a lot for the call, Dan. No, nice one, mate. Cheers. I appreciate you coming on, pal. So Cheers. hopefully the uh, listeners will uh, pick up some good stories from you, mate. So what I like doing, pal, when we, when we get into these, is just going straight into, you know, like sort of your childhood and stuff like that, really, mate, or just some of your early days. So you could, I don't, what were you like as a, you know, a, a kid, a teenager, you know, were you, were you always as sort of focused as you are now, with, or were you, you know, a bit of a tear away, anything like that? Bit of both, I'd say, mate. Bit of both, if I'm honest. Um, I mean, as, as, as a kid, I think I was just an average kid, mate, in yeah. all honesty. I've never won a race at Sports Day or nothing like that. I was never captain at football team. I was never like a, a high achiever. Yeah. But I was never a, I was never a too bad of a tear. It was your kind of general tear away, you know what I mean? Where you're younger with your mates and you drink alcohol on a weekend and you know get up to no good but I wasn't too too much of a like I didn't didn't get arrested every weekend or anything yeah. like that um, <laughs> not too much of a bad fairly, life, yeah I had a fairly steady childhood mate if I'm honest fairly steady childhood and, up, uh, and teenage life and school life and that yeah so the only, the only thing um, was school for me mate was I just wasn't interested in school at all yeah. there's, there's nothing anyone could do to get me motivated to take it take a pencil case to school yeah <laughs> uh, yeah nice. but yeah that's a, so like you didn't do much sport as a kid then did you not like not like you're now necessarily no no nothing like now um uh, i tried sport as a kid obviously I, like I, I play football for the school football team but i wasn't i was never any i wasn't one of the first picks or anything like that i was like average at football same with rugby um Sports wise, I, I used to go boxing as a kid. I think that I think boxing, I'd say, was the was the first thing that actually I did as a sport that that, that I actually put one hundred percent effort into. If you get what I mean, I I turn up to football practice and stuff, but I was only there because my mates were there. Really, um, you know, I, I did martial arts as a kid as well. I, I tried some like karate and stuff like that, but it it just never gripped my interest. It was too, uh, it just didn't grip me interest, and I. I the first time I really put any effort into sports, I would say, was with boxing when I was about, from about the age of 14. Right, so did, um, you, did you compete then as a kid or was it just... Yeah, I competed a few times at uh, boxing, yeah. I, again, nothing special, nothing good. Uh, I, think it, I think I had about five or six amateur fights as, as um, like before I joined the Marines. Uh, but nothing nothing to write home about. Um but it was it, for, for me, it was always... It, it's been the Marines that made the massive... Um, Kind of transition in my life made me change the way I thought and the way I lived and the way I put effort into things. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So obviously we'll get on to that in a minute, pal. So, so the Marines then that was the next thing we were going to move on to. There. So, um, how old were you when you joined? Am I right in thinking I, I tried to do a little bit of research on you, pal? Was it twelve years you served? Was it? Yeah, I, so I joined when I was seventeen, mate. Um, and I was talking about this last night on a podcast. If, if you're ever joining the military, don't join at 17, join at 18. Right. Well, go on, why is that then? Because I joined at 17. I yeah. left after 12 years thinking I was going to get um, a half pension. You know, where you, you get your 12 year point, you get your half pension. Yeah, yeah. So about two weeks before I left, I'm ready for like, let's line this ward up, you know, how much am I getting? <laughs> Nothing. Because if you join at 17, the time from 17 to 18 doesn't count towards your pension. Oh, you're joking, man. So, yeah, yeah, I left and uh, uh, pretty much exactly 12 years and they were like, yeah, you're not getting a penny, mate. So, I got nothing. So, advice for any dads out there, if your kids are joining the military, get them in at 18, not 17. So, just out of interest then, because that, that does make me think, like, did, did were you not tempted then to just stick it out for another year then or d does it not work well, like that? Wheels were in motion, mate. What, what had happened is we'd already put... Um, We'd already got the lease on the unit that the gym was going to be in. Right, I see. And um, so, so when I found out that I wasn't going to get 
the half pension was like really close to my it's what you call your TX date. It's that's like the date you leave. And I'd, the wheels were already in motion. We had the unit lease. We, we'd started rigging it out, and so, so I was going home at weekends and ripping the place out. I didn't have a day off for about nine months. Right. Um, it was at the point where we were probably about four or five months away from opening. So to do another year and to stay in for another year, I would have had to totally put that on hold. And it, yeah. It, I just couldn't do it, you know. Um, no doubt you'd have probably... It's kicking the nuts, money. mate, but it is what it is, isn't it? It's part of life. Of course it is, mate. And, uh, and no doubt you'd have put a lot of money into it as well and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's understandable, mate. Well, lesson learned there. <laughs> lesson learned. <laughs> Right, mate, so you did 12 years, yeah? So I, I take it, um, you know, you spent a fair, fair bit of time, especially being in the Marines, like abroad, touring and things like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Quite a lot, yeah. I mean, the, the time I joined, I joined in 2000 and, and left in 2012. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and if you, look at, if you look at the British military and there were kind of activity levels before and after that, I think that 12-year period is probably the... the the, the busiest yeah. 12 year period that the British military's had for a long time in terms of kinetic warfare. So, yeah. um, because like, I mean, before that, the, the, the last real proper war we were in would be the Falklands, you know. We, I mean, don't get me wrong, we were in the Iraq in 1991 as well, but that, that was more of an aerial campaign than like a real ground campaign, a prolonged ground campaign. Mm -hmm. But then two, 2001 came. Twin Towers and all that. And yeah. We've been in Iraq and Afghanistan from then till about 2014. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty busy time frame. Mm -hmm. um, I feel lucky that I joined during that time frame because I got the amount of experiences I've got from that time that people who joined before or after are just not going to get. Yeah. I mean, I, and that's a good thing, by the way, because I don't, I don't want us to be going to war every ten yeah, years. Of course, yeah. So yeah. you know. Um, but, but at the same time, I feel lucky that, that I've got all them experiences because it was a pretty hectic 12 years and uh, 12 years that I loved every minute of. Right. Well, that's good then, isn't it? I mean, so just sort of with you mentioning, like, say, the, the, the Twin Towers and things like that then. So obviously when that happened, I take it, you know, you'd literally have been in for like a year. Is that a, when the Twin Towers years? happened, yeah. on the day of the Twin Towers happening, I was on a coach about to travel to the airport to fly to America for um, an exercise. So we, we were just about to... Thing. Yeah, we were about to fly out to... I think it was called 29 Palms. We were going to go and do a, an exercise where you do six weeks in the desert, desert training, and then you go to the mountains, you do six weeks in the mountains. Um, and we're on the coach just about to, to drive there, just about to leave um, 4 2 Commando Barracks. And the sergeant major literally just jumps on the coach and he says, lads, get all your kit and go back to your rooms and wait out. And we're all like, what's he talking about? You know, we're going to America, right? Crazy. Uh, and he was like, nah, get your kit, get your weapons, go back to your rooms, wait out and put your, put your news on and you'll see what's going on. And we're all like, this man? you know, we got back to the rooms and then the twin towers are falling down and we're all like, we're going to war. <laughs> you yeah. know? It was pretty intense then because we, we were obviously still planning on going to America. And yeah. We had to go. They sent us home for a week's leave because there was nothing that they knew we weren't going to be traveling anywhere within a week. And then when we came back, we had like a a daily briefing on what you know what what the picture looked like. And eventually, about three or four weeks later, we did go out to America anyway. We went on that same exercise that we were planning on going on. Uh, it was a bit of a crazy experience, but I can only imagine, mate. But your your story of where where you were when it happened is a bit different to mine. Anyway, mine was just my twentieth birthday, and I was round at my mum's. Hey. <laughs> I was just round at my mum's house, and she just said, "Hey, look at this on news." And that's that's as exciting as my story gets. <laughs> were you drunk? No, I wasn't. Middle of day, I had my little lad with me. I was a daddy. Oh, right, right. Age, so no, it was day, daytime when it for us. So I wasn't. No. <laughs> right, mate. So. Um, as I mentioned in the, you know, the little intro about you, um, you're still a pro MMA fighter, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, when did that start to take place? I mean, I'm assuming um, it started coming about while you were still in the military. Because I, yes, I did, say, yeah. um, for those that don't haven't, you know, maybe followed you or, or know about you, you you appeared on the Ultimate Fighter. 
Yeah. The uh, right, UK yeah. versus USA. Was that right? Yeah. On that one? Yeah, that was like back in, uh, it was, I think it was about the back end of 2008, I think. Yeah, because, well, to be honest, mate, I remember I watched it myself, like, because... Um, oh, did you? Nice yeah, one. I did, mate. Yeah, I did watch it. Um, did watch it. I was gutted when, when you uh, left the competition. Uh, yeah. But um, especially because, like, because I know, like, we mentioned uh, Steve Millward, Widge before, and, uh, he, you know, he, he was banging on about you a lot. Yeah, and, I bet he was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Guy. Yeah, good lad. Um, but, yeah, so... so you, Obviously, no doubt by then you'd already had a few pro fights and stuff. So when did the when did the MMA, you know, either training and then the competition start to come into into play for you with the with your military career as well? So, well, I, I turned professional in MMA. I think I had my first pro fight in like two thousand and seven. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd had a few. I never I never did the amateur fights. I went semi pro. It's a bit of a weird thing because in in MMA you used to have amateur, semi pro, and pro. I've got right. no idea why it should have just been amateur and pro. Like, yeah. um, the amateur fights were, they were just a weird rule set. You weren't allowed to. There was no like headshots at all. Right. So you were allowed. You were allowed to. You were allowed to throw shots to the body and legs, but not at. It was like a bad grappling match with leg kicks. Yeah. So I decided never to do the amateur. But it's changed now. They don't do that anymore. By the way, okay. for anyone at home that's watching now, amateur MMA is serious. Man, there's some really good kids in the. Uh, but in my day, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. So I never did the amateur. I went straight into semi-pro fights. Uh, so I had five or six of them, and then I turned professional in 2007, I think it was. Yeah, 2000. So obviously, I was still in the military at that time. So uh, from 2007 till 2005, it was pretty crazy because we had, we had Iraqs and Afghanistans and stuff going on on one side of the thing. And then I'd get home, and I'd be like, right, I've got two months. Let's squeeze a fight camp in. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, so. But hey, listen, if you want to do something, you do it, don't you? You don't, you don't, you don't sit on your ass and talk about it. Correct, mate. You make it happen. Yeah, find a way, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Totally agree, pal. So, um, with being in the military then, and and this sort of MMA career, sort of on the horizon, if you like, um, did you have to take long breaks from competing or? Did you yeah. get, did, were the military good with letting you have time off? How, how, how does it work? No. Not at all. No, mate. So, so this, is, this is how it works, right? So it, it, in the army or, or the navy or something, if there's like a boxing competition coming up, they'll put a yeah. boxing squad together. And those, say, eight or ten lads will be a dedicated boxing team. So they'll go to the front of the queue, they'll wear track suits, they'll go to the front of the queue, dinner queue, get the nice yeah. food and that, and they'll get to box twice a day and, Live like an athlete for for whatever period of time. Not the Marines, but if the Marines is about soldiering, you're a you're a Marine first. You're yeah. a soldier first. Anything else, and because it's such an alpha male mentality in the Marines, lads are like, well, fucking hell. If you can't box after being in the field for six weeks, you know, are you really a boxer? Do you know, <laughs> <laughs> lads, lads are just expect you to be at. Lads are just expected to be able to overcome any obstacle and do anything at any time, but it just doesn't work, you know. But I never, no, I never, I didn't get any time off. I got, so when I went to the Ultimate Fighter, yeah, obviously I got selected for that, and they sent the letters through, and it, I think it was like twelve weeks away over in Vegas, yeah. And I went to, I went to see our like commanding officers and stuff to see if I could get the time off, and obviously they were like. Nah, you're, you're not having time off that. But then a, a little bit of um, push and shove, and I, I had some pretty, you know, pretty decent blokes fighting my corner for me, and it ended up to the point where I, I did manage to get the time off for that. Mm-hmm. Um, even though just before I won, when like my mate Pete Jordan, who was actually he, he was actually my sergeant major at the time, he was like, "Fuck it, just go, mate. If they catch us, who cares?" You <laughs> know. Uh, I was like, "I'm pretty sure they'll catch us, mate. It's on TV." Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So apart from that, no, I never got any time off. That's the only time I managed to get any time off from the military. But the thing is, in something like the Marines, like you'll know in the fire brigade, you end up having very close relationships with your with your seniors around you. Yeah, it's not it's not like um, the Marines is not like another military unit where it might be you know totally hierarchical as in. Yeah, you, the sergeants speak to the the corporals and the lower ranks as if they. are It's not like that in the Marines. Everyone's we're all on first first name terms and stuff like that. And uh, yeah. 
So even though I couldn't officially get time off to train, a lot of the times I say to like Al was one of the best mates and it mates and he was my sergeant. I say Al, can I can I fuck off home this week for some training? He'd be like, yeah, no worries, mate. See you Monday. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah, under the table time off. Yeah, but that, I suppose that kind of thing though, it's like um, it builds that little bit more respect, doesn't it, for him if you because they, if they know they can trust you. Yeah. You know, if they yeah, give you a yeah. word, you'll be back by such a day. It's, it's builds more respect and trust, doesn't it? Yeah, of course it does, mate. Yeah. yeah. And then I hope that, and then obviously <clears throat> the other thing about the Marines is always going over and above in it. So if if Al's going to give me a week off to go and train, then when we get back, if there's ten shit jobs need doing, my hands got to go up to do them on it. Yeah, so of course it does, mate. It's, it's the way it goes, isn't it? Yeah. Right, that's right, mate. Yeah. So when did the um, you've got, like I mentioned, you've got your own gym. Uh, <laughs> Full, is it still called Full Contact? S SBG Rochdale. Ah, it's SBG, so as on the T-shirt, yeah. Straight Blast, yeah? Yeah, Straight Blast, Jim Rochdale, yeah. <laughs> so um, when did that come about? When was this idea? Were you, were you training at other gyms and just thinking, like, I can do a better, build a better place than this? Or was it just, it was just a... No, it was never, I mean, it was, it's never been about building something better. It's just... I, so, obviously, I was in the military... Um, <clears throat> I'd been in for 12 years and we I just got back from Afghanistan. Um, while I was in Afghanistan, my son was actually born seven weeks before the end of the tour. Uh, I came home. I came home while... So I, while you're in Afghanistan, you get a two-week leave period. And my two-week leave period, I saved until my son was going to be born, if mm -hmm. you get me. So I was in Afghanistan for about five or, five months or so. That just as he was getting born, is I got my leave, so I got home to see him be born. It was perfect. Oh, then I had to go. Yeah, it was great. But then, then I had to go back for seven weeks, obviously. And um, it, it, you know, it was all kicking off again. It was it was pretty hectic seven weeks. Um, yeah. And it, it was like that for me. I was like, you know, am I even going to see me? He's only just been born. Am I even going to meet him? And I, I don't. Get, I've already missed at this point. My daughter was already like four years old at this point. I'd already missed plenty of her life, you know, being yeah. away and coming back. And I'm missing her on this one. I'm bringing her on the sat satellite phone and stuff. So I, when I got back from her, I was starting to question, like, although I loved every minute of it, Afghanistan and, and all that sort of stuff, I, but I, I didn't, I was starting to question, like, am I, am I being a bit selfish here? Am I just doing things that I enjoy when I've got kids at home? Do you know what I mean? And yeah. then I, I got back from there and obviously I had a few more MMA fights and the, it was kind of like the, the level I was fight competing at in MMA I wasn't competing at an exceptionally high level at that point mm -hmm. but it was high enough that I either had to commit fully to yeah. make the next steps or I had to knock it on the head and just commit to the Marines uh, I couldn't they were, uh, the both jobs I was doing I was doing it like at a level where I had to I don't like half assing things if you get me yeah, and it, I felt like if I'd have continued to do both, I would have been half ass in it. So yeah. I had to choose one or the other. <clears throat> I felt like I'd given the Marines everything I everything I had. I, I gave it twelve years of. I was a committed soldier, you know. I, was, I really was a committed Marine. Um, I felt like I'd given everything I had to it. Mm -hmm. I felt like I'd really enjoyed every minute of it. I loved it. Um, I got an everything out of it as a person that I wanted to get out of it. I travelled the world a bit. And I felt like it was. I was happy to close the door on that chapter and start, start set off on a new chapter. If you get what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So is this and is that around the same time the gym started to become a? Well, well that that's when that's when I opened the gym. Yeah. The right. original, that's, so as I was leaving, I, I as I, as I was leaving the military, I was starting to build the gym. If you get what I mean. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Awesome. So, and that's like a simultaneous thing. I, I didn't want to leave and have nothing to do. Uh, yeah. I was only, I, I mean, the only two things I was leaving the Marines for was my family and the fact my fighting career. Otherwise, yeah. I'd, 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 I'd be in the Marines till the day I died. Otherwise, I loved it. Right. Well, that's good. That's good, eh, mate? Yeah. So, um, right. So, moving on, mate. You just recently, um, no doubt things are a bit different and up in the air at the minute, but you opened a restaurant as well, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so I'm a, I'm a part owner in that. Um, yeah. I'm my business partner, Michael. He he runs the whole operation. 
Right. Okay. Uh, so, so I can't take any credit at all yeah. for it. It's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all he's doing, all his, um, all his brain work. Platos Bibidas. Yeah, well, make sure you well, give everyone the name of it, mate, so you can send yeah. some business your way when it opens back up. What's the name of it? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. What's the name of the restaurant? Oh, yeah, I just said it. <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's called Platos y Bebides. It's on um, Ferry Road in Rochdale. In Rochdale. What kind of, it's a tapas restaurant, yeah? Yeah, so it's like tapas, but we do, we do a lot of different things. Like um, They do like a South American tapas, a Mexican tapas, a nice. Spanish tapas. It's, it's, it's quite a good theme, I think. Some of your listeners should pop down. <laughs> Definitely, mate. Well, you know, when things are back to normal, so to speak, we'll, uh, we'll try and get up with the missus. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so at the moment, right, so you've got this gym you're running. You've obviously, you're back home with your family now. You've, you know, you've got uh, your businesses, so we said that you're running. Um, and I know with you being still officially a pro MMA fighter, do, do you find it's difficult to sort of fit your own training in because one, you've got your family, you train your other athletes because I know you actually coach your athletes as well, don't you? Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. What, do, you, do you have a set schedule for your training or is it just like you're fitted in like me whenever you can, you know, whenever no, you can? No, I set, set a schedule for it. Yeah, I set a schedule for it. I think, uh, I mean, the, I, 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 I don't say So I feel like, I have to schedule my training in because if, if I don't schedule it in, if, I, if I've got six hours in a day and nothing to do, that six hours will, will get eaten up, you know, when you've got absolutely X amount of fighters. To, but it's not just the fighters either. It's, it's the, the other, I've got 60 kids that I coach, you know. Um, and then the whole gym as a whole has probably got 150 kids that we coach. Uh, so these, if, I've got to schedule things. If I don't schedule things, something will pop up, a problem will occur or something will happen. So I have to schedule things. But more more and above from that, I feel that I'm always banging onto my fighters about scheduling things, about time management and stuff like that. So I feel like if I'm not doing that, then I'm just living hypocritically, aren't I? Aren't I? So yeah. I feel like I have to do If I'm going to be the coach telling people, you need to schedule, you need to stick to time, and you need to do X, Y, and Z, feel like if I don't do that, that's... From the Marines, I always like to lead by example, you know, so... Of course, mate. Yeah, I, I definitely try and schedule my training. In. Awesome. So, with the, uh, the... Just moving on to, like, sort of family side of things, with... Obviously, we're still officially under lockdown at the moment, so, I mean, this episode will be going out probably a couple of weeks after we're recording, but um, are you finding... Um, that now the kids are off school, you've got less time on your hands because you're not in the, even though you're not in the gym or you're finding you've got more time on your hands because obviously everybody's different. Uh, mate, at the moment, I'm, I'm not lying. At the moment, the last four or five days, it's been crazy. I've not had a minute to myself. Um, Tell me just about the it. message. Yeah, just the, me the messages, the emails, trying to get a, 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 an app up and running at the moment for me, some of the clients that were, that some of the members that have gone like online. Yeah. And we're doing online programming for them, setting some tra training work out on that. So, nice. Yeah, and, and also I'm trying to stay ahead of the game, mate, because we don't know what the future is going to look like when gyms reopen. And I think yeah. it's going to be much more aimed towards personal training and small group training. Yeah. So I'm just trying to shift my uh, the gym's business plan to cater for that. Because at the moment, if you pop into the gym on a Monday night, you'll see five classes at the evenings, and there'll be forty people on each class yeah I don't think we're going to be allowed to do that for a while so I think you're right mate it could be a long time that yeah yeah so I'm just trying to strategize for that and get the plans in place and put booking systems in place and stuff so that I can get all my members through the doors and we can train well, yeah I suppose that's the good thing isn't it you, you're thinking about it because I think there'll probably be a lot of people a lot of businesses even not necessarily like you know fitness or fighting business whatever tr any kind of training whatever business uh yeah, won't necessarily be pivoting as they're all calling it and, and sort of shifting yeah. how, they, how they work a bit. Will yeah. it? Well, mate, look, anyone that doesn't is, in my eyes, is, is just burying, burying their heads in the sand because Absolutely. The, it, it's the information. We live in the information age. All the info's out there. Uh, you know, there's people out there that will help you yeah. do this kind of stuff. And, and it's, it's, it's quite obvious what's going to happen. So, if anyone is at home and, and you've got a business and you and you're kind of sat there not knowing what to do, 
do exactly what Dan said, then get up and get moving, get some plans for the future because you're going to have to pivot. Yeah, and it's, um, it's, I think, big thing as well, like you just said, the people that are out there that can help you is like it's reaching out to people as well, isn't it? Because like I've got, um, yeah. like for my online coaching business and what have you, my personal training, that, you know, my online stuff, um, I have my own coach for that as well who helps me sort of um, yeah. create sort of better content online and yeah. reach out to the right people and stuff like that, you know, so that's yeah. that's what you've got to do. You've got to reach out to people who, you know. Mate, you've got, absolutely. I'm in the same boat. I've just started a coaching program at the moment where, where I'm being coached online about setting up these software systems and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's important, especially as, as coaches good. ourselves. I think that's important that as a coach, you have a coach. Yeah. Um, I see that a lot in martial arts. People who've like done a certain amount of years and, and have reached a, a certain level and then they start they take on the role of I'm a coach now and they start coaching people but don't but don't continue to train or be coached themselves yeah. and then you see it and then in a couple of years time their game's dropped off and they're like you're like what's going on you <laughs> yeah well, everyone's thinking well, how are you still coaching people well that's it you I know? think and a, a big thing I like, I do think is like, especially from, from the type of stuff I do, and I've no doubt, especially with learning all the various um, forms of martial arts you guys have got to do for your MMA, uh, for MMA careers, is that I don't ever, if I was talking to other coaches, I would never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know exactly, what I mean? Yeah. 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 I I've never had that problem, so. Hey? I don't think I'll ever have that problem. <laughs> But that's the thing, isn't it? That I always want there to be something extra I can learn. And, and I don't, yeah. you know, there should never be a point where you think, right, I can't learn anymore. Well, I think if you ever reach that point, number one, you're, you're, you're deluded. But number two is go and do something else. If yeah. I reach the point in martial arts where I think, ah, oh, I've made it now, I'll move on to something else. I don't think I'll ever reach that point in martial arts because I don't exactly. think anyone should. You know? And that's the thing, you've, you've probably lost your passion in a bit, in a way, then, that's, haven't you? That's my point, yeah. I think yeah. If, if you do reach that point it's not because you've learned it all it's because you've forgot it all you know you've forgot yeah, what yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely mate so um obviously we've, we've mentioned your kids um you fortunately managed to get home to see the the birth of your your son wasn't it yeah 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 so, Jensen. whether it be um in whether it was in the military or even being at home really now what what's like the sort of toughest challenges you find being a dad whether it's anything to do with yourself with your work and stuff or even with your kids themselves, what do you what do you find difficult being a dad? For me personally, it's just the time management because obviously, every, like as a dad, you start a business and you run a business or, or you go to work, you do your job. But at, at the end of the day, every, all of the, the only reason you're doing that business or that job is to, to provide for your children and make them a better life. You know, absolutely, Paul. I could live in a desert for the rest of my life. I wouldn't give a shit. I don't need new clothes or nice cars or I don't need I don't need anything. The only reason I need anything more than you know and make a, a decent salary is to provide for my kids and my wife and make you know make our family life mm -hmm. as easy or, or as comfortable as possible, should I say? Yeah. And as um, not just comfortable, but give us the ability so that I can take my kids and make them experience things. You know, take them on holidays, places, see different cultures and stuff. Yep. But then you get trapped in that in that bubble, don't you? Where you're working your bollocks up all the time. You never get home to see your kids, and yeah. then you start thinking, oh, "I'm doing that for that," but then I never get to see. Do you get what I mean? And yeah, absolutely, mate. Of so for me, the, the hardest thing as as a as a dad has always been, the, and and continues to be the time management of of making sure that, or trying to make sure that I don't take on too much you know, in the first place and then not have enough time to spend with my kids. But that's something I'm, I'm really, really working on and, and, yeah. and I genuinely am working on that and, and I have been working on it for a long time and that's why this isolation period, I'm just seeing it as a bit of a blessing in disguise because I've got to spend a load of time at home with my kids. Mm -hmm. got to do a load of stuff with them that normally they'd have been at, work, at school so I wouldn't have been able to see them. Plus, right. I'm using this time to try and plan my future now. Yeah. You know, what? one of the things... and. You've probably heard this before, mate, but I'll, I'll say it anyway on the uh, podcast because it might be a bit of advice for dads at home. But one of the things that on this coaching course I started, one of the very first things they said they got us to do was to plan 
what your future perfect day would look like, you know, your future working perfect day. Yeah. Sorry, perfect working day, should I say. You know, instead of like, like some people aren't out, you're, you're going out first thing in the morning, coming home last thing at night and blah, blah. So they got us to plan our perfect, perfect day and then work, build the business or build, rebuild the business looking towards that, if you get what I mean. Um, so that was quite interesting um, because it just gives you another perspective. Because normally, yeah, of course, normally your, your day is spent <clears throat> catching up on yesterday or whatever it is. But um, that, I thought that was a good, good way of looking at it. Yeah, it is, mate. Definitely, I totally agree with that. It's like something I probably sit down and do myself. That actually. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they said to us, don't, that, what one thing they said is they said don't plan your business, plan plan your life. You know, so what do you want your, your life to look like, and then we'll fit your business around that instead yeah. of doing it. And I felt like. When I opened the gym, I did it the opposite way around. I planned the business and then my life had to fit in around that and it doesn't yeah. work for that long. Um, so that, that's the one thing I've struggled with or found the most difficult is time management, but that's how I'm trying to uh, deal with it at the moment, like uh, better it. Yeah, so from that time management aspect then, just out of interest, is there anything at the moment that, uh, whether it was before this lockdown period or what, but is there anything you make sure you 100% do with your kids, whether it's I make sure I'm there for when they go to bed or whether it's this, that, you know, is there anything you, you think that's one thing I, I make sure I don't miss out on? So I, I wouldn't say there's one thing like, like that because, again, the way... My, like, you, you must know with shift work it's a bit mad you're all over the yeah. place aren't you I'm the same yeah. but I just make sure that every day that I make sure that I do something with them every day yeah. and I have a good conversation with them every day about something you know I just if I, if I go to bed at night I've got to have done something with them what, whatever that is but then there is there is a lot of stuff that's scheduled in there like you know my, my son has got jiu-jitsu twice a week he's got football in the mornings and stuff like that mm-hmm. um, so there is them kind of things that are scheduled in and like during this lockdown period I've been trying to spend time baking with my daughter she's baking every day Yeah, I just try and make sure I have fun with them every day do something that's a good bit of fun a bit educational or a bit you know a bit productive and, and uh, have a good conversation with them yeah perfect that mate sounds perfect right mate so almost coming to the end now pal um, and as I've done with all my guests uh, and we've had some good stories so far mate and I did give you a bit of an heads up so uh, have you got an embarrassing story you can tell us to show all the dads listening that you're human, that you don't mind, you know, making a fool of yourself? Any good stories you can give us? So, wait, I, I was saying this to you earlier. I actually found it quite hard to think of an embarrassing story because I was like, <laughs> I don't really get embarrassed by much, you know. Yeah. When you've been choked out on TV in front of hundreds of thousands of people watching it live, there's not much more can embarrass you. So. I know, mate, I know. <laughs> so, one thing, I, one, one I came up with was from when I was, uh, I'd just, just passed out of basic training in the Marines. So, I'd, I'd done my recruit training, I'd passed out of basic training. And what you've got, uh, what you've got to envisage is, when you join basic training, you're on the bottom of the ladder, right? And then every week, as you go along, you climb the ladder, you climb, so you get to your pass out parade, much like the fire brigade, eh? Yeah, you pass out, and then as soon as you pass out, you're back to the bottom of another ladder, aren't you? Yeah. You're the ship. You're the ship bloke, aren't you? You're yeah. the new bloke. Yeah, you know, FM, skip it. FMG, fucking new guy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the, guy, the guy who knows nothing. And in the Marines, or back, especially back when I, when I joined, it was 20 years ago. It was a different time. It was hardcore. You, you were. It, we used to call it sprog routine. You, you know, you got treated like an idiot until you proved otherwise. So I was the idiot. Back then, and uh, we, we were on an exercise because we, we were um, training to go out to Northern Ireland for six months, and um, we we're on this exercise. We've been out doing patrols and stuff all day, it's pouring down wet, freezing cold. And it's just a not just a typical shit day out on the out on the moors in the Marines, pouring down, and uh, there's a big circle of all the old like the. We call them sweats in the marine, the, the old sweats, the people who've been in, you know, the lads who've been in for a while. Been in for all the sweats. Time, yeah. And it's pouring down, and we've got a few hours off, and they're all stood around having a cup of tea and having a laugh, and you know, they've got the weapons hanging off them. And I'm, I'm sat just outside the circle, like looking up at them because I'm the new guy. I'm not getting invited into that circle. I ain't, pr- I'm not worthy of standing in that circle yeah. yet. <laughs> I ain't proved myself yet. 
And I'm just like looking up, thinking like, I'm super motivated though, by the way, at this point. I'm looking at these lads thinking, oh man, a couple of years, I'm going to be like them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a... They, they, to me, they were like switched on. They knew yeah. their job. Do you know what I mean? That's what I wanted to be. And then one of them called Lee Waters. And Lee, I'm going to tag you in this when it comes out. I don't know if you remember this story. But um, <clears throat> one of them called Lee Waters looks down at me. He's got a metal mug in his hand, yeah? Like a big mug of coffee. Yeah. Like this, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like the military metal mug. It's horrible. Yeah. Like thin, thin metal, tinny. He turns around and I can't, I don't even know what they were talking about. But he looks at me and he goes, that's right, in it, steps, Blah, blah, blah. And I've looked up and I thought, fucking hell, Lee, Lee Waters knows my name. This guy was like a mountain leader. Right. And mountain leaders are like the legends. We're terrified of them. They're, they're like psychopaths. You know, they're the guys who take you on 50 kilometer runs and they don't stop running and they've got 200 pounds on the back and you just can't keep up with them. They, they should be locked up. Uh, so <laughs> Lee's like invited me to join the group and I'm like, whoa, I couldn't believe that he even knew my name. So I've joined the group and I'm like, Standing there, proper You're proud, and, yeah, <laughs> chest out. Now I'm, I'm one, of, I'm one of the boys now, and uh, they're all spinning dits. That's what we call, you know, telling stories. Spinning dits. We're all talking, blah blah blah. And there's all this going on, and Lee's got his mug of coffee, and he turns to me and he goes, "Oh, fucking hell. sorry, mate. Do you want a drink?" So I'm like, "Fucking hell!" So he's like handing me the mug like this, and I've gone, "Oh, cheers, mate. Nice one, Lee." File right into it, grab the mug, and bear in mind, I'm a young kid, so I'm I'm keen as mustard to, you know, to be one of these lot. The mugs that I've just grabbed it, I've gone, cheers, Lee. Ooh. And that, there's no coffee in that mug, mate. It's just puddle water. Oh, lovely, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> so he, he just freezing cold, scoops it up out of the puddle. Me being young, he knew exactly what he was doing. I've just grabbed <laughs> it, and gone, cheers, Lee. <laughs> and it's not dawned on me till like the first gulp that it's puddle water. Oh. But I'm talking muddy puddle water. It looked yeah. like coffee. It was that brown. And then I'm just... And this big group of old sweats are like... Yeah, fucking dog. <laughs> <laughs> just totally abused me then for about 20 minutes. And I've gone sat back down. And I was just so embarrassed, mate. Not Just embarrassed that I'd let myself believe that these lot were going to... No, I've been in two in minutes. <laughs> I've been in for two minutes. Just the fact that I believed that these lot were going to join me into the, the crew after two minutes. It was like, sat there like, oh, was I thinking? And uh, yeah, so that was my embarrassing story. Yeah, that's a good one, that mate. I like that one. I, like, I can picture it very well. <laughs> yeah, Lee's getting tagged. I don't know if Lee will remember that one, but. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it'll be up on the uh, social media and that's, so you'll have to make sure you tag him, mate, definitely. Yeah. Uh, right, mate, so pretty much calling it a day now, so. Uh, before we do shoot off though do you want to let everyone know where they can find you on social media find your gym on social media or whatever you want to advertise yeah if you want to find us on, on social media it's SVG Rochdale if you go to uh, SVG underscore Rochdale on Instagram or just SVG Rochdale on Facebook um, my, my social media's uh, Instagram is stapes 50 cal or is it 50 cal stapes so that's one or the other stapes 50 cal I think um, I'll, uh, I'll make yeah. sure I put it in the show notes anyway. Yeah, nice one, yeah. Catch it in the show notes. Though. Awesome. <laughs> that sounds professional. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> I've listened to enough podcasts for the all little uh, the little nuances and that. <laughs> yeah. Right, mate. So thank I really appreciate your time, mate, because I know no, you're mate, thank before. you for giving me a call. Thank you. I, I I know you're a busy guy and and what have you. So your time's much appreciated, pal. Cheers, and, uh, man. Thanks again, mate, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll meet again soon. Yeah, definitely. All we'll right. have a lockdown session when it's all over. F4, mate. Take it easy, Charlie. See you later, mate. See you, mate.